Thank you so much. It's always such an honor to speak here. Um, I'm going to be talking specifically about the role of lipid emulsion in uh, cardiac arrest. I apologize, I'm getting a little bit of laryngitis, so hopefully I'm going to make it through here for you. Uh, I have no disclosures. And um, I could have labeled this talk uh, treatment of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. I spoke with a few colleagues and other members at this meeting uh, yesterday and said, you know, what would you really want to hear about? And they said the things they wanted to hear about was, this really isn't on my radar. It's something that happens so rarely. You know, please review kind of the symptoms that I would be looking for and really what are the current guidelines for using uh, lipid emulsion in this case of systemic toxicity. Okay. So, to begin with, I wanted to go over some of the symptoms. And the first thing I want to say is it's very hard to predict what you're going to see. The vast majority of cases of local anesthetic toxicity don't spiral down in a uniform manner. They skip around. Uh, you may have this sort of nonspecific numbness, peri uh, perioral tingling, metallic taste, or you might not. You might go right to the cardiovascular collapse you have both excitatory and inhibitory symptoms. So you can see sort of this restlessness, sense of impending doom, some muscle twitching, the excitatory component. You also have the confusion, drowsiness, unconsciousness, eventual respiratory arrest, just from the CNS toxicity. The most common symptom, although not there in all cases, is the seizure. Well, what about the cardiovascular toxicity? Again, very hard to predict what you're going to see. You have both excitatory and inhibitory components. You have your tachycardia, hypertension, possibly initially, then followed by significant myocardial depression from the sodium channel blockade, decreased cardiac output, hypotension, vasodilation, and then you go into your conduction abnormalities. Initially, you might see a little bit of widening of the QRS, some ventricular arrhythmias, and having it just spiral down into VTAC, VFib, torsades, asystole, and complete collapse. Okay. This is something we do every day on OB. We give a lot of local anesthetic. We give fairly large amounts. And so what I really want to impart to you is to be vigilant. Even though you get in the habit of doing the same thing every day, don't take any shortcuts. Okay. So what are the recommendations for preventing local anesthetic toxicity? Things you're all familiar with, use the recommended doses. You're going for that C-section, you've put in 20, 25 cc's of 2.5% lidocaine, the block's not really where you'd like it, probably that extra 5 cc's is not going to do the trick. That would be the wrong answer. Test doses, ASRA is a big proponent of test doses using a vasoactive substance. The thing I would say is every dose should be a test dose. You want incremental dosing, you want to wait between every single dose and aspirate before each injection. The other thing is have the patient well monitored with the standard monitors. Observe <clears throat> careful observation of all the vital signs, ask them questions, or other symptoms of local anesthetic toxicity. Certain individuals are, in, uh, are at increased risk. If the patient already has severe cardiac dysfunction, especially a low ejection fraction, right, peripartum cardiomyopathy, they're at increased risk. Their circulation time is much slower, and stacked injections can build up in that patient. Okay? People with liver disease, if the patient arrests and becomes acidotic, things get even worse, and their tissues are even more susceptible. Okay. So <clears throat> back in 2010, um, American Society of Regional Anesthesia put together a task force and put out a practice advisory for dealing with local anesthetic toxicity. They updated this in 2012 with a checklist. You heard about checklists on the prior uh, lecture, and I'm a big advocate of checklists. I've put this uh, in your syllabus, as well as references where you can get this online. It's a one-page checklist. Okay. It's also been validated 
um, in simulation, and it definitely improves people hitting all the correct points of resuscitation from local anesthetic toxicity. So I broke it into a few slides rather than putting the whole thing up at once. So obviously, get help, airway management is key. You wanna avoid that acidosis. If the patient is seizing, you need to break the seizure to control the airway. The guidelines say not to use propofol. It's a direct myocardial depressant. You want to break it with the benzodiazepine, right? The other thing was prop with propofol is people say, well, it's got some lipid in it. Why wouldn't I want to use it? We're going to use lipid emulsion. It doesn't have enough. It's only a 10% solution. And the 100 mils plus that you would have to give to even maybe get some effect is going to have such a detrimental effect on the patient. Ezra says, don't do it. The other thing is start thinking early about alerting either people at your institution or other institutions for cardiopulmonary bypass. These resuscitations don't always go well, and they can be very prolonged. And so you'd like to start those wheels in motion early on. Okay. You're going to use the standard BLS, ACLS, Dr. Lippman already talked about but there's some adjustment of the medications that have been recommended by ASRA. So in some uh, animal studies, vasopressin does not work well in these situations, and they recommend epi. The recommendation for epi is that you reduce the dose to just one mic per kilo, rather than that full ampule of epinephrine. And that also is based <clears throat> on animal studies that show uh, less effectiveness of the lipid emulsion with the high epinephrine doses. Other things you would want to avoid just due to the nature of the arrest, the sodium channel blockade, is you should avoid the calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or, although it's obvious, giving more lidocaine as part of the ACLS algorithm. So what about the lipid emulsion therapy? So standard lipid emulsions now are available in 20%, and the values that are provided in this checklist are for a 70 kilo patient. Recommendations are an initial bolus of about one and a half mils per kilo, followed by an infusion. And you can repeat the bolus once or twice for persistent collapse, right? You can up your infusion rate and double it, and even if the signs and symptoms of the toxicity have gone away, you should continue that fusion for a good 10 minutes or so afterwards. What's sort of the ceiling amount that's recommended? This is based on rat studies. Uh, it's really at about 10 mils per kilo of this lipid emulsion. Okay? Additionally, although not stated on this checklist, is that should you have this and the patient recovers, you want to continue monitoring for at least 12 hours after that event. So prolonged monitoring in a high acuity setting. And as you're going to see, most of our evidence for use of this lipid emulsion is based on case reports. And so consequently, it really behooves you to post these events on the websites listed there so that we have more documentation uh, of use of this drug. So I'm just curious, I'm gonna kind of take a risk here. Everyone who has lipid emulsion readily available on their labor and delivery unit, raise your hand. Okay, all right, great. That's what I was really hoping to see. And I don't know if it was quite 100%, but it was almost there. So um, you're right in line uh, with this paper that was published uh, about a year ago. And again, how does this stuff work? Bottom line is we don't completely know. Um, we have, again, some basic science evidence and some animal evidence. Uh, definitely a large component of it is sort of a lipid sink, right? Where you have lipophilic drugs like local anesthetics, they preferentially go to the intravenous lipid emulsion and you can slowly begin to have them sort of extract out of tissue. But there seems to be another mechanism that's been shown in some rat models. And that's really for a um, <clears throat> direct 
cardiac ionotropic activity. So on the top red arrow, that's sort of the lipid sink that's going on, where you're binding the free local anesthetic. But on the bottom one, what happens is bupivacaine actually directly blocks fatty acid metabolism and production of ATP uh, by taking out some critical enzymes. And the lipid emulsion seems to reverse that effect in some animal models. So you may have two mechanisms at play that are really benefiting this patient. So you're spiraling down, you're starting to see some of these symptoms that you're recognizing for local anesthetic toxicity. When should you intervene? When should you pull this out of the drawer and give it to the patient, right? Well, probably you don't want to wait till you've already gotten into cardiovascular collapse. That would be a little too far. And on the other hand, it's probably a little early for everyone that just has a little uh, metallic taste in their mouth or ringing in their ears. So it's going to be in between those. But I would say at first signs of any significant, significant cardiovascular changes, rhythm disturbances, changes in blood pressure, loss of consciousness, I would be uh, getting the lipid emulsion. Okay. What evidence do we have? In humans, it's case reports. And this was the first case report that was put out in 2006 for use of lipid emulsion successfully from bupivacaine-related cardiac arrest. There's more and more case reports. I've given you some references that have them in the syllabus. There was a case report on, in an obstetric patient in 2007, uh, published in anesthesiology, where it was successfully used. Uh, they saw return of consciousness and cardiovascular function within 30 seconds after they started infusing it. Okay. Editorial from a couple of years ago, there's not going to be any randomized trials for this, right? As it is, local anesthetic toxicity, thank goodness, is incredibly rare. And it's really believed to be unethical to do this at this time because we have some evidence of the efficacy, benchtop science, animal studies, and now the case reports that's, that are coming out. Should this bother you? Well, we don't have case, or we don't have any good randomized controlled trials for parachuting, use of a parachute. This is a great article if you want a uh, humorous read from the British Medical Journal, 2003. I like sort of the what's already known about this topic and what the study adds. Right? We don't have any randomized controlled trials for pulse oximetry. Nice uh, systematic review in 2009. No evidence that pulse oximetry affects the outcome of anesthesia for patients, right? But yet we use it every day and rely on it. Okay. So what are we doing uh, in the future with lipid emulsions? So more work to better understand the mechanism how this works for local anesthetic toxicity, trying to determine ways to improve the dosing, right? What else can it be used for besides local anesthetics? It's been used for propranolol overdose, verapamil, Haldol, so on. And then trying to determine the adverse effects. There's rat studies that show sort of a threshold on dosing up at 67 milligrams per kilo, so the recommendation of 10 per kilo is well under that, but we don't really know. And again, I'll go back to if you have an incident where you use it, put it on that website. The more evidence we have, the better understanding we have, the more effective we're going to be at safely taking care of these patients. Okay. So in summary, be really vigilant. Put this back on your radar looking for local anesthetic toxicity. Practice those techniques that reduce the likelihood of it happening. And again, everybody's already got it immediately available, but if you run into colleagues who don't, encourage them to have it. Thanks. <laughs>